Um, OK, let's try this again. So uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to another installment of our online seminar on 3D geometry and vision. So uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Tatjun Chin. And Professor Chin uh, holds the SmartSat CRC Professorial Chair of Sentient Satellites at the University of Adelaide. He is also the Director of Machine Learning for Space at the Australian Institute for Machine Learning. And Prof Chin's research interests are in optimization for computer vision and machine learning and their applications uh, to robotic vision and also uh, space. So I think we're in for a very uh, exciting talk today. Um, so without further ado, then let me uh, hand over the floor to uh, Prof Chin. Uh, thank you very much, Angela and colleagues, uh, for inviting me to speak at this uh, very interesting, very prestigious seminar, seminar series. Thank you as well to Gim He for being a panel on, on, uh, on my talk here today. Um, so uh, first, some acknowledgments to the uh, funding agencies and also, uh, more importantly, acknowledgments to the researchers, you know, who mainly worked in this area, primarily my colleague, Dr. Bo Chen. So here's a, here's a quick rundown of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the agenda for this talk. Start with some background, given the title and uh, I guess remit responsibility of my current position, I need to introduce a space, con I should introduce a space context. In any case, the space context is a very interesting one. In particular, um, there are uh, certain operations in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, space or satellites where, where we need to estimate the pose of a target object. For example, a satellite attempting to dock with another satellite or a satellite attempting to uh, grab a piece of space debris using a robotic manipulator. Okay, so uh, it is a classically uh, a computer vision problem, uh, robotic vision problem more precisely called visual servoing. Uh, our part in this uh, in this whole process is really the vision part. So this talk is still a vision talk. Uh, more specifically, given an image like that, mm, we're supposed to predict the pose of the object uh, from from the image. All right, pose as in the the position and the orientation of the object with respect to the observing camera. So when it comes to pose, uh, um, you know. Uh, the fundamental problem that we aim to solve is the perspective endpoint problem, whereby we are given predicted landmarks of corresponding 3D points in the image, as well as, of course, the 3D coordinates of the, the points uh, that was estimated before, either estimated from structure from motion or from the blueprint of the satellite, let's say, or the object. And given these two inputs, we have essentially 2D, 3D correspondences. And also, in addition to that, if we have camera intrinsics, the PNP problem minimizes the sum of square reprojection errors and outputs a 6DOF pose. So that position and orientation I was talking about. OK, uh, the pose is uh, represented by Y in our case. The landmarks, uh, the, sorry, the 2D, 3D correspondence are X and, and the Xs and the Zs. OK, so given the Y, uh, we could project the, the, I guess, the 3D points and the wireframe into the image. And that's how we get the green lines here, the wireframe, all right? This is a way of illustrating the pose that we estimated. So uh, a point that I should clarify is that in this context, we know exactly the, the landmarks that we are interested in. We know which, we also know of obviously that how many landmarks we have and it's N, all right? That N is fixed. Um, yes, okay. So given that we're in the age of deep learning, naturally, you know, it's, uh, you know, people have been asking, how do we add deep learning into this uh, process? And it's not me who invented the way to inject deep learning here, but I think a good way is to use the deep network to map the input image directly to a set of 2D landmarks, okay? So um, thereby uh, um, obviating the need for handcrafted features such as SIF and SURF and so on and so forth the deep network can learn uh, this uh, landmark prediction uh, uh, black box function, okay? Um, and because it's not handcrafted, it's more robust to different conditions as we see here, for example, when the background contains the earth or when the object is really small, you can't really hope for SIFT and SERP to work here. And also when the contrast of the image uh, object isn't great, uh, deep networks excel in this condition here. 
Okay, so during inference, uh, it's clear what the deep network should be doing, given the image, uh, uh, well, and then pass it through the learnable weights and to predict the, the landmarks XIs. Now, for training this deep network, for training, the, for learning the weights, uh, uh, you know, an obvious thing to do is to compare the pre during training. So we will have images of, of the input output pairs of this image and 2D landmarks. Given these uh, ground truth landmarks and predicted landmarks, we construct a loss and then backpropagate that loss through the network to learn the weights. Okay, so this is textbook stuff. Uh, the question we ask in this work, though, is that um, what if, uh, well, not just what if, before that, fundamentally, the final output we want isn't, aren't the 2D landmarks. The output we actually want is the pose, okay? And we do have access to ground truth poses when we train uh, the, 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 uh, train the network. All right, so if we have ground truth poses, can we compare that with the, so if we have ground truth poses, can we compare that to the predicted poses and then backpropagate that error all the way to the learnable weights, okay? The, the difference this time is that we need to backpropagate through this PNP, which is not a deep network, which is not a network, there are no learnable weights, it's an optimization problem, okay? So that's the question we ask. Generalizing this further, you know, we could have a problem where at different parts of the network, we insert, uh, 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 we insert optimization functions. We, we insert uh, not just a, a handcrafted mapping, but we insert uh, uh, optimization problems. So therefore realizing what we call, what I call optimization layers into the neural network. And then we combine these optimization layers with the learnable weights. How do we do this? How do we back propagate the loss from the output of the net output layer all the way back, passing through these optimization layers? So one approach is to use fully connected layers. Instead of inserting those optimization, instead of defining those optimization layers as optimization problems, let's just replace it with a fully connected network. Okay, and this is also one of the earliest methods tried. Uh, whereby we get the fully connected network to output a 60OF pose, so translation and, and uh, orientation and rotation, right? Um, the issue with this is that it's not so easy to compute geometric objects. For example, a pose lies on a manifold, for example. You need, it, it's hard to constrain the FCN to output only the objects you're interested in. And also, um, in my opinion, this is probably more subjective, a, a weakness of this approach is that it does not allow the wealth of experience met and methods from geometry to be used, right? So for example, in this context, we know PNP, we know how to solve PNP, we know how to characterize the solution, we know a lot about the problem. But if we use an FCN to replace the PNP solver, we've thrown away all that known information. Another approach is to uh, approximate uh, 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 gradients to, in order to, to optimize. By the way, if, if, the, if the SC, FCN approach, then, then you know, standard, you compare the predicted pose with the, with the ground root pose, get the error, back propagate through the SCN, FCN, as well as through the learnable weights for the landmark prediction. Um, so another approach is to optimize the gradient, right? Uh, you uh, approximate the gradient, sorry, using, using samples. So uh, given the current predicted y, sorry, given the current predicted x, in this case, you perturb x around a neighborhood, neighborhood nx, and then you get different x's, and then uh, you pump these different sets of therefore 2D, 3D correspondences, get different yi's, get a m of them, and then you use this information to uh, 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 numerically estimate the gradient and then backpropagate, okay? So this works in practice. Um, I think there are many initiatives in uh, many research directions in, in neural, uh, in deep learning that's doing this, um, you know, but the gradient ultimately is an approximation and this can be expensive is if M, the number of samples you need M is large. Okay, so we asked, is there a better way, more principled way to do this? And yes, the answer is through implicit uh, function differentiation. 
what is what the what is that this is actually a pretty textbook method some of you might jump in later and say oh we've known this since forever it's true we've known this kind of thing since forever hundreds of years um but um I guess uh, highlighting this uh, technique in the age of deep learning is still a contribution. Anyway, what, what is it about? What is this implicit function theorem? So say we start, given a very simple example, we have a relationship between two variables, X and Y, okay? And this, this uh, relationship is encoded in this, say, constraint here. And our task is to differentiate Y against X, okay? So the so-called explicit method is to express y as a function of x. So you write y equals something x, that something that can take x only in there, sorry, y as a function of x only, and then differentiate as per normal, okay? May not be possible to do this, however, because you might not be able to express y as a function of x only. Try using this, you know, it's just not possible, okay? So this explicit, uh, function does not exist ex exist the implicit method we've all done it when we did a high school calculus course you know we've we've implicitly learned the implicit function theorem uh, at high school right so what do we do we differentiate the whole constraint against uh, x and uh, and therefore getting that leaving dy dx s as the unknown that we're hoping to get and then we collect terms uh, dy, all the dy dx put it on the side and the rest of it we put it on the right hand side. This is therefore the uh, uh, differentiation of uh, y against x done implicitly. Okay, so different from the explicit method, however, uh, the, the gradient, the differentiation now, uh, uh, the first derivative, the derivative contains y as well, not just x. Okay, the implicit, fun implicit function theorem is, or the IFT is a generalization of the simple rule that I just described to you. Okay, uh, I will show you an example later to show that it's exactly the same thing. Bear with me as I read through this theorem. Um, let's say we have a function f mapping from r n plus m to m, and let that function be continuously differentiable with input a, b. Okay, so A and B together make up the, the input space for Rn plus M. Okay, if I give you a point A star B star and it satisfies this condition, so F of A star B star equals to zero, and the Jacobian uh, do F do B evaluated that A star B star, that's the matrix, that's a matrix, is invertible, then there exists an open set U such that A star and a unique blah, blah, blah. In, in other words, speed it up. If these two conditions are, 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 are satisfied, then the IFT says that there is an implicit function G of A, whereby A only comes from a region around A star, such that uh, uh, G of A star equals to B star, okay? If these conditions exist, then implicitly somewhere there is a function mapping G to, uh, mapping, function G mapping A to B, okay? Moreover, we're able to get the first derivative of that function with respect to A, and it's given by that, uh, that equation there, okay? So the Jacobian with respect to B, Jacobian with respect to A, uh, take the uh, uh, inverse of the, the one with respect to B, multiply the one with respect to A, and you get the gradient of G. You get the, the uh, first derivative of G. Applying this on this simple example we saw earlier, that condition there is our f okay so if i give you an a star b star which is a solution such that f a star b star equals to zero and then the ift says if you turn through all the rule you can get dy dx as that that there and this is a straight application of equation 11 here okay and you can check the answer from the high school method it's exactly the same Okay, in the high school method, we wouldn't have learned what the IFT is, but it is essentially the same thing. Okay, so that's the IFT. High school method, uh, not a new technique at all, uh, 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 basic calculus. Now, how do we do IFT on PNP? Maybe we need to start off by saying, why do we want to do IFT on PNP? Coming back to here, uh, Again, 
if we can get if we can interpret um, uh, the PNP. PNP we know is an optimization problem. We need to solve it using level bit Markwa. We need to solve it using gradient descent. Blah. It's an optimization problem. But if we can define an, an, an implicit function that maps these inputs to the output y, and then get the, the, the gradient of that implicit function, then we can back propagate the loss through the PNP solver. That's why we want to do IFT on PNP. So the next question is, how do we do it? Uh, what are the specifics? OK, so uh, uh, disclaimer as well as acknowledgments of, uh, of, uh, of previous work that has applied IFT in computer vision. All right. I did say that it's a standard textbook topic in the whole of calculus. That's true. But then it's been applied in computer vision as well. Earliest I know, I personally know, you know, I don't have a long memory history, historical memory of computer vision, but earliest I can find is uh, from Forgera 1993, uh, where IFP has been, uh, has been applied. Not in deep learning, but in vision and on geometric uh, vision. Okay, so um, now let's apply the IFT on PNP. The input to PNP is our 2D, 3D correspondences. Uh, the 2D correspondences as we've shown before, is predicted by the deep network. Z are, are the three D points that are fixed. Okay, and K is also a constant. Now, we want to find a pose that minimizes the sum of square reprojection error. That's P and P again, where R I is a reprojection error from the I two D three D correspondence. Okay, we solve this using iterative nonlinear optimization, L M gradient descent, Newton's method, whatever you want. But the important point is that we solve it up to a local optimum. OK. Now, to apply the IFT, we need to construct this constraint function f, whereby we have two sets of inputs. One, uh, the first set a are the 2D, 3D correspondences and the camera intrinsics. And b is the output of the PNP, which is y. OK. We're going to construct f in a way such that um, an implicit function g exists, whereby g maps a, a are the 2d3 correspondences and camera intrinsics, into an output pose y, and that output pose y is the solution of the PNP. Okay, now, there's a reason why I highlighted the local optimum here. Under the assumption that the PNP solver we use optimizes up to local minimum. And as usual, whether we are at a local minimum or not is subject to numerical error, blah, blah, blah. But theoretically, we know that um, uh, iterative methods will eventually get there. Uh, you can talk about the convergence rate, blah, blah, blah. But we know eventually we'll get there. But in practice, it's subject to numerical error. Leave that aside. So assuming that it is locally optimal, the solution y, then we know that the, the first order uh, uh, differentiation of the objective function with respect to the estimated pose is a zero vector, all right? It's a stationary point, um, a local optimum, or rather a stationary point. I think a stationary point. OK, we construct f as this, where f1 to fm M is a number of variables in the pose. So M, M is, uh, hang on, M is six, yeah. So we differentiate against, for each of these F, it's the partial deriv derivative of O, which is the objective function, sum of squared reprojection error with respect to the J uh, pose parameter, okay? You can work it out, it looks like that. Um, the point is that now we've constructed our condition F, whereby given 2D, 3D correspondences, sorry, X, Z, 2D, 3D correspondences, hammer intrinsics, the internal solver, Lambert, Marco, whatever, outputs a Y. If I plug Y into F, where F is as defined here, I get a zero vector, okay? So that's the first condition of the IFT. Now, we can also show that if the 2D, 3D correspondence are in general position, then the Jacobian of F with respect to Y is always invertible, okay? Now, the two conditions of IFT have therefore been met, and we can calculate the gradient of the, the gradient of the implicit function G with respect to the inputs to the function F, X, Z, and K. Just plug in the IFT uh, uh, theory. Okay. 
So let's see how this works. So this is a simple experiment whereby we fix the so this is of a, for a single image, right? So this is not, not the practical, uh, practical solution at all to anything. It's just to validate that our application of the IFT on PNP works. We have a single image, one image only. And we know that in the image, we have an image, we have the object of interest and we have a network that predicts a 2D landmark, okay? As usual, we pass it through uh, the PNP but this time we differentiate it. That's why we call it BPNP for backpropagatable uh, PNP. And uh, the loss function we use is a combination of the projection error as well as, so actually this is the projection error. This is comparing the projection of the estimated pose as well as the ground truth pose, okay? So the first term here, we're using ground truth poses to, to supervise. The second term here, we're just comparing the ground truth uh, 2D landmarks to the predicted 2D landmarks. Okay, so just a loss that is differentiable and we can back propagate back. So the picture that you see here is the evolution of the loss as usual. And this is on the right hand side, the evolution of the key point. The, so as we train the network, uh, the, so this is the network whose parameters we're training. Uh, the more we back propagate, uh, I think we're using uh, um, S, SGD here. Doesn't really matter. As long as we, we, we can back propagate, you can use GD, SGD, whatever variant you want. The more we, we back propagate, um, the more the network is able to predict the ground truth landmarks, okay? And this is just the prediction of the current predict, uh, projection of the current predicted pose. And you can see that it also uh, gets to the uh, target position eventually. So that shows that it works using a simple experiment. Another experiment also just to verify that this IFT on BPNP works. Um, this time we construct a network with a fixed input of one and it outputs uh, the structure. Now we're trying to predict the 3D reconstruction. Our input would be multi-view feature tracks. So um, this is a synthetic experiment, by the way. So we have, uh, I think this is from a standard data set. Um, so we know the landmarks, we select the landmarks. Uh, we merely, uh, we project using a number of synthetic poses into a number of images of these landmarks. We perturb it using noise. Uh, we perturb it with noise, of course. And now we have 2D landmarks. And also because we have the 3D structure, we sample the three landmarks. We, we therefore have correspondences in other words. We do not, sorry, I, I, I forgot what I, we do not have 3D landmarks. We're trying to predict it. Sorry, we're trying to predict the 3D landmarks. We're trying to predict the 3D structure, but we have the ground truth 3D structure where we use to get these images, okay? So the loss is the sum of square of, yeah, well, sum of square of the 2D landmarks, which is the data and the projection of the predicted uh, uh, 3D structure, okay? So similar thing, you should, we show that, you know, as, as the error is being uh, uh, reduced by, by prep propagation, the prediction network eventually estimates the 3D structure, okay? Is it a practical application? No, of course not. As we said earlier, these experiments are just to check that the IFT works as we expect, as the theory promises. And the fact that we can, in this case, get back to 3D structure uh, is, a, is, a valid, is a cool validation of that. Okay, so this is the practical part. This is the part that uh, CVPR reviewers, I guess, will, will focus on. What are, do you have a table with bold numbers? Yes, nice theory, it works, you're the first to do it. Does it beat anyone? Does it beat the state of the art? That's the final section there. Okay, so we need to get state of the art and we show this uh, pipeline to achieve it. So this is a full pipeline already from image with a HRNet backbone, predict landmark heat maps. From landmark heat maps, we learn another network to call DSMT to uh, convert the landmark heat maps into discrete 2D points, okay? And, uh, and um, 
in this case, we are doing pose estimation. So uh, uh, according to the line benchmark, we have the 3D landmarks. Uh, we don't have the 2D landmarks. We have the input image. Okay, so we're trying to learn HR net parameters, DSNP parameters, so that it predicts the landmark accurately. All right, what we're doing differently than others is that our loss is a combination of the heat map loss. So we're comparing predicted landmarks as well as uh, comparing the, the poses, okay, ground truth poses. And the ground truth poses are compared by uh, projecting the shape using the current predicted and the ground truth pose and comparing the the projection uh, to get the error. Okay, so we, we're using supervision from both the ground truth pose and the and, and the landmarks for this. Um, and um, yes, so we managed to get the bold numbers we want. We show that if you add the pose loss to the pipeline to train the pipeline, it bumps it up by by one percent. And the code is available on this page. Feel free to try it out. And yeah, that's the end of this talk. Okay, thanks, Professor Chin. Um, so I think maybe we can proceed onwards to the questions because we had a bit of a delay in the start already. Um, so with us today is uh, Kim Hee Lee. He's uh, my colleague here at uh, the School of Computing at NUS, um, and uh, we will be now uh, discussing the uh, the work that uh, Prof Chin is presenting. Um, Kim, would you like to start or? Sure, I think uh, Chin, thank you for the talk. And it's a very interesting work. And as usual, your work is very well grounded mathematically, <laughs> which is kind of impressive. So I have a question for you here. I mean, you are analyzing the, so this is a, uh, the, I mean, in the literature, this is uh, the 6D post estimation, object post estimation that you are trying to get, right? and uh, you are using the implicit functions to do the PMP, making sure that it's differentiable. My question is that uh, because your network is designed on the 2D key points part, and your but your supervision is on the 3D part, right? So is there how, how do you prevent degeneracies here? I mean, in terms of the solution, because I think that uh, uh, there could be possibly a set of 2D key points that might actually fit into your 3D observation and still get that post, right? So how do you actually prevent this? Uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we never thought about that. We never looked into it. This might be uh, something interesting to look into it. Off the top of my head, I think the scenario you mentioned actually supports the usage of optimization blocks in deep networks. Because if it's me, I would try to impose the solutions of the geometry in the optimization block as a constraint. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would prevent solutions that I know cannot exist. I see. But this would this be more tedious or would this call for another form of optimization because i think in deep learning the loss function is usually unconstrained optimization i mean we'll just use a naive uh, gradient descent right, in the loss function to train the deep network now if it is a, a constrained optimization would this call for a more sophisticated form of optimizer I would say no, because uh, I think there are variants of Levenberg Marqua where you can add constraints. Sure, as a regularizer, right. perhaps. As as a as a as a hard constraint, even. As a hard constraint, I see. right? And and uh, you, you can use the uh, you know uh, uh, um, you know Laplace uh, uh, constraints to make sure that you still get the iteration gets you to the local optimum or a stationary point. Mm. In, in fact, I think the scenario you mentioned argues more for adding optimization bo blocks. I see. I see. If, if you flip the other way around, how would anyone add that constraint in the learnable weight side anyway? How do you prevent the, the, the combination of weights? How do you prevent it from giving you solutions that you know cannot be true? How do you add that constraint in the learnable? I'm asking purely as a question about that because I don't know. I 
I'm not too sure. I mean, in in because the it seems like uh, you are arguing that uh, it should be done in terms of a, I mean, a form of regularization, right? Is that what you are trying in, to in, in the optimization block? In yeah. the optimization, yeah. Yeah, but, off the top of my head, that's what I'm thinking. It may not work, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking that in you in, in our PNP here, mm -hmm. if, if in, instead of just solving the standard, uh, solving the, uh, um, oh, by the way, the standard PNP actually already have constraints, right? Yes, sure. The, the Y must lie on SO3 or SE3. Mm, yes, there are yes. already constraints there to begin with. So let me, but Mark what definitely can handle constraints. Sure, sure. I see. What I'm proposing mm -hmm. to solve the issue you mentioned is we just add a few more constraints saying that your, your Y must only come from a certain certain region. I see, I see. Would it be difficult to define that particular region? Because it, it, what you are given yeah. here is just the, uh, you have the 6D ground truth post mm -hmm. for training, right? Yep. Uh, and uh, so, but this doesn't tell you much about that degeneracy regions. I mean, the space ah. of the degeneracy regions. Right. Yeah, so it might be kind of, uh, I mean, it might be kind of difficult to actually detect the whole range of solutions that might be degenerate here. Yeah. And to prevent it. But to flip the, flip the sorry for harping on this point, to flip the uh -huh. question over, if, okay, sure. if, if we want to add the constraints in the learnable weights, that's even harder, isn't it? Yes, that's the, that's why I think that this might be a very hard question to actually so, for, for example, if we use an FCN, mm -hmm. how, how would we say FCN, the FCN network can only output Ys that are non-degenerate? Sure, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think my feeling is that it's harder to do that in FCN. Uh, I see. Yeah, so another uh, question which might be slightly related to this is that uh, because as uh, I mean, the learnable weights, the network that you design, it's uh, based on the 2D landmark prediction. So how do you ensure, and because your supervision is only on the PNP part, and uh, how do you ensure that the 2D landmarks are distinctive? That means that it's, it's really a key point here, right? Because I wonder, I, I just wonder this, like, uh, I mean, I don't have a substantial proof on this, but I just wonder that given a set of 3D key points, could it be possible that uh, the what you would predict in the 2D, right? I mean, it could actually degenerate into a line or it could actually degenerate into something else. And it still fulfills the uh, 2D, 3D. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so is that, a, how do you ensure the distinctiveness of this key points yeah um i i think it's a it's a related question to the first mm -hmm. one how do you ensure non-degeneracy also in the 2d landmarks right? yes that's right that's right in in our work we're not we're not considering that but again so that's an interesting thing mm -hmm. to consider off the top of my head maybe and uh, by the way to clarify what you said earlier uh mm -hmm. gimhi we're actually using both the the landmark loss and the pose loss. So you have a 2D ground truth for the landmark? Yeah, we have 2D ground truth, yes. I see, I see. Oh, okay. Then that would actually resolve the distinctiveness problem. But I mean, I can envision cases where we don't, for some reason, we don't have the 2D ground truth. I don't know why. It, it, it's unlikely because if we are given 3D landmarks mm -hmm. and we are given ground truth poses, you can actually can just project and get the 2D landmark ground truth, right? Right. I don't know. Maybe there's a scenario that we are not allowed to use it or whatever. Then we can only use supervision from the pose. We have tried that as well. And it's not as accurate to using only the pose. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's not as accurate as using only the 2D landmarks. I see. Using only the pose is as not as accurate as using only the landmarks. But combining the two is the best. I see. Sure. I see. So, but you didn't, 
through your experiments, you didn't observe any degeneracy cases? In, in our case, no, not in a 2D landmarks. Mm, I see. Uh, because that, that would have been obvious. Mm -hmm. um, the pose side, I don't know. You've got a good point there. We need to, we should go and check. Mm, okay, I see. Actually, following up on this front, um, how can we incorporate this for scenarios where we might be able to estimate the 2D landmarks but not get uh 3d landmarks or ground truth for the 3d um it won't be a standard pose estimation problem i guess it will okay. be a, it will be a purely uh a landmark prediction problem feature tracking problem right feature identification problem so I'm thinking of scenarios like, so for instance, in body pose estimation and hand pose estimation, where we can mark these uh, features or landmarks in 2D relatively easily, but they're not very precise, but it's actually very hard to get uh, ground truth in 3D. Um, also because the 3D, the true 3D ground truth, uh, it corresponds to some unknown location in the 3D structure, right? So it's almost impossible to get this precise 3D location. Yeah, and also your object is articulated, isn't it? If it's, yes, uh, body but body let's body. Uh, if we disregard the articulation for a moment, let's say, is if we, dis if we, dis if we disregard the articulation, then it would be a standard object pose estimation. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, you as you said, you probably have noisier 3D landmarks, ground mm -hmm. truth. Um, I don't know, maybe you want to have an objective function in the PNP, which is um, pays attention to that inaccuracy, maybe. I see. So then in that regard, the, the but you're saying that the bulk of the supervision still comes from the 2D though, right? Because, or at least using only the 2D is more accurate than supervision from- only the pose, yeah. Right, okay, I see, yeah. I see. So uh, um, in, in, the, in the pipeline part where we demonstrate state-of-the-art performance, we need to combine both, uh, I'm, I'm totally honest here, um, um, in, in, my, in the evaluation of my, our own work, um, in our state-of-the-art pipeline, the, the method that gives us the bold numbers, we combine both the 2D landmark supervision and the post supervision. I see, I see. But from a scientific standpoint, I guess my personal goal is to show that you can backpropagate optimization blocks in uh, deep networks. Maybe this application isn't the best showcase application but theoretically to demonstrate that it's doable is, mm -hmm. uh, is my characterization of our contribution. I see, I see. No, I, I think, think this is a good embodiment a nice, of that. Yeah, I think it's a very nice application here. It's a very relevant application here. Yeah, yeah. there could be others. We're trying to look at others, but I uh, don't have time yet. I see. I have another question here. Uh, so you, because in the 6D post estimation, object post estimation that you showcase here, ransack would not be a issue. And, but in general, if we were to talk about the PNP estimation problem, right, given a set of a 3D point cloud and a query image, I want to find the uh, pose of this camera that takes this image. Uh, usually we'll start from uh, I mean, detecting the 2D key points and the 3D correspondences, there are definitely a lot of outliers here. How do you, uh, I mean, do, have you thought of how do you include this RANSAC into the pipeline here? In fact, I'm glad, very glad you asked this question, Gim He, uh -huh. because um, when we add PNP here, we actually added PNP with RANSAC. Oh, you actually, then how do you make sure That's that- That's the works? first thing we added uh -huh. because we think that at the start of the learning, mm -hmm. at the start of the learning, uh, let me illustrate. Okay, maybe, that, that, maybe, maybe using this. At the start of the learning, the 2D landmark predictions are poor. Sure. You initialize the networks randomly and then you, you, we see that the, landmark, the, the 2D landmark prediction is poor most of the 2D, 3D predictions are outliers, okay? So we think, okay, since they are outliers, then we should use robust PNP. 
we should run PMP with Rensac. Yes. That's but actually. In this case, you might end up with no solution at all. Right? No, the, the problem, maybe we're saying the same thing. The problem with adding Rensac is that because Rensac is robust, it ignores the wrong prediction and there is no supervision signal to correct for the learnable weights. Exactly. Therefore, we shouldn't use robust PNP here. We use just least squares PNP here so that every single inaccuracy from small inaccuracy to large errors, every single inaccuracy is felt in the PNP. Mm -hmm. If it's felt in the PNP, the loss will go up and then it will back propagate it to correct for the, for the learnable weights. Mm -hmm. So it took us a while to figure that out. How come adding RANSAC with PNP make it doesn't work? There's a very good explanation for this because RANSAC can ignore outliers. Because it ignore outliers, there is no correction signal. There is no loss to minimize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is uh, pertaining uh, training. I, I'm absolutely convinced by this explanation. But yes. how about uh, during the inference stage? Oh, right? because in, in the inference stage, yes, use, use RANSAC, of course. So RANSAC can be just added into the pipeline during yes. inference? Stage. Inference, yes. In, after, in the inference, like here in the inference, in the feed forward, um, now the network is trained. It predicts landmarks. You, it could predict long, wrong landmarks. So the PNP, we should actually use the robust one, yes. I see. During inference. But during training, cannot use the robust one. Mm -hmm. Cool. I like this work a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Peter. I think there's a question uh, in the in this. Uh, in there's this. some questions in the chat, actually, from yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Um, he says that it's a fascinating talk. And he's asking if you have any tests using semi-transparent objects or if you might be able to make applications also to uh, object post estimation in video. Um, so I've posted the question into the chat also. Yeah, uh, thank you, Matthew, for the question. Tests using semi-transparent objects. We definitely didn't do any tests using semi-transparent objects. Um, I guess perhaps a superficial remark on that is that the contribution of the work is on the PNP side, how to back propagate it. How to deal with transparent objects? I'd say it's more a question of network uh, uh, architecture design and parameterization. Uh, second question, possible applications to object pose estimation in video. Uh, very interesting question. Indeed, in the application talk context that we, I'm giving here, our input aren't still images. Our input will be a smooth video sequence. Uh, putting a robotic vision hat on, you know, would we, be passing every single frame of the input to the network to predict. And then I would smooth it over using the usual post graph estimation or EKF. Um, third question, any preferable initializations? Okay, so this, I need to guess what Bo Chen, my colleague did. I think he did mention that during training, the learnable weights were, were optimized randomly. He tried random initialization. Um, any preferable initialization? Off the top of my head, I can't think of any because if random initialization already works, then, then we, we didn't look further into preferable initializations, no. Do you train the 2D heat map first on its own then? In term, like if we're talking about initialization here, are we training first this heat map uh, and the 2D landmark detection first before uh, incorporating the uh, 3D and the optimization? Uh, we, that would be a good way to, to you know, initialize better. But in the, in the experiments, everything, I believe, if I remember correctly, everything was started randomly because we really wanted to see the effect of uh, backpropagating the PNP to see if it actually gets us the, learn the weights that we need in the networks, in the network. I see, I see. And does having this actually, I, I could imagine that this should facilitate or slow down training then? Compared if you to initialize just... the networks by training using the landmarks only? No, um, compared to learning 
with only the 2D landmarks, does adding the optimization block uh, speed up or slow down the training? Like the convergence rate? I'd say it would slow down training. It from slows a, it from down. A, from, a, from a basic standpoint, you know, you need to compute, you need to solve the PNP in every, every back propagation. I, I, uh, true. A, in, yeah. in clock time, yes, but I could imagine in terms of the number of iterations, it could possibly also speed it up. It could possibly slow down. I, I would say it probably slow because you're adding more, more constraints, more supervision to the, to the weights. Aha, uh -huh. I see, I see. Okay, I see. Okay. The end, one, if one more yeah. question here, no, that is you, you are training this based on the line mod data set. Right. So I guess yes. in this data set, there are several object categories, several object classes. And did you test on how well the method actually can generalize to unseen uh, object categories? Because I guess here, what you are trying to learn here is that you are given a certain object class or a certain specific object. Uh, during training, you are specifying the 3D key points of this object category. And you are trying to learn, given a query image, you are trying to associate, learn the key points, 2D key points that associate with this particular object class. Right? So after training, did you test it on uh, unseen categories? And how well does it uh, generalize to this unseen category? Um, two responses to that question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think in the context of the line mod challenge, the, the landmark prediction is object specific. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're not expected to, the network, any at the train net landmark prediction network is not expected to generalize to unknown objects, only that specific objects. Mm. So, so the direct answer to your question, therefore, is that we didn't try mm -hmm. to, to generalize, to test the pre-train, the train network on a different object. Number two, um, the generalization of interest here would be generalizing outside of the training conditions, I guess, for the same object. Mm -hmm. So my perception of line mod, I could be wrong, is that the testing set and the uh, training set, the conditions are similar. Yes, so yes. I would say as, a, as from a practical standpoint, mm -hmm. whether, whether it generalizes deserves more, more, uh, uh, more investigation. For example, I wouldn't expect, uh, if I train uh, the, the duck landmark detector on line mode data set, I wouldn't expect it to work if, if I run the train network on a YouTube video containing the duck, same duck because the conditions of the training are so different sure. than the testing one. So generalization is still an issue, but this is a general issue of learning methods, I guess. Mm -hmm. So in contrast to the conventional uh, key point detectors like SIF or SIF, I guess uh, this is still something where the conventional techniques outshines the learning approaches. Um, um, Gimhe, you know me, I'm on the same team as you when it comes to comparing traditional geometry and, and learning, uh, sure. but to be, to be diplomatic, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're in front of an international audience now. I think there are pros and cons. Mm -hmm. The traditional methods, in my opinion, I don't know about your, your experience, Gimhe, uh, in my experience, the traditional methods, when they work, they work very well. When they don't work, they fail catastrophically. Yes, sure. So there uh, are pros and cons. I mean, there are pros and cons. Yeah. In, in this particular aspect here, I think that the generalization. I mean, it would be nicer if we can make the deep learning uh, approach to be able to generalize well. Right? Mm. I mean, this is still an open question. Right? Yeah, I would say. I mean, there's no right or wrong here. No, yeah. So in fact, when, when we started off with this data set, right, the mm. first method we tried is actually the traditional method. Mm. Compared, given, given an image, given these two images, okay, not, not these two, but something less challenging. But you know what I mean, given two images of the, of the object, estimate uh, using SIF estimate key points and then match the key points, do the standard thing. We tried that. Mm -hmm. 
it, it doesn't work well in conditions where the contrast is poor in the in the second image mm -hmm. or the object is very small. Mm -hmm. So in these conditions, it fails catastrophically, and we do not know how to optimize or or change the sift black box so that it works for these conditions. I see. Yeah, agreed. But for the deep learning approach, mm -hmm. all we needed to do was to give it more data. Sure. Right. Um, so that's the advantage of the of the deep learning approach. Sure. I think that's a very uh, balanced and diplomatic answer that you're giving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so actually, Matthew has a follow-up question in the chat. He's asking about the inference time. Um, so especially if you apply it to video, then what, um, how much time it takes to do inference per frame? Um, apologies, I don't have that information. Um, I, I, is, is any of you able to estimate from the pipeline how expensive this is going to be? It's a standard HRNet backbone. I think standard DSNT, given a, I don't know, VGA size image, how, how fast is that? Oof. I think with a decent GPU. I think it should be very fast. It should be very yeah, fast. Yeah, it should right? be reasonable. So it's, uh, I think this runs, you can get this to run at reasonable frame rates for video already, right? Mm. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. In, in inference, because in, in uh, Matthew's question, it's inference. In, in training, the situation is a bit different because we need to solve the PNP at every every time we back propagate. Um, so maybe as a concluding thought, um, Prof Chen, do you have any, uh, would you like to share with us maybe, are you planning to incorporate more optimization blocks into uh, your deep learning frameworks or other uh, aspects that you're delving into along this line of work? So I tried to uh, persuade my uh, teammates to, <laughs> to add more optimization blocks. One thing that I like to do is add iterative closest point, ICP. It's not that different from PNP. It's still estimating uh, you know, a, a pose, but uh, that instead of comparing 2D, 3D landmarks, we'd be, com we'd be comparing 3D, 3D landmarks. So it'd be useful to learn networks that not does not predict uh, landmarks, but network that predicts uh, dense depths, all right? Imagine yeah. the network is still the same, but instead of predicting landmarks, the HR net actually predicts uh, dense depth. Every single pixel assign a depth, right? Mm -hmm. And depth is a 2.5D, not 3D, but we could conceivably construct um, uh, um, comparing uh, uh, the, the predicted 2.5D point cloud and the 3D point cloud, which is the ground truth, let's say supervised using uh, the depth channel of an RGBD. And then we can compare them using ICP as the actual loss. One finer point that makes that different from the current one is that we don't need to associate the 3D points. No prior association required because ICP also estimates the association. Oh yeah, exactly. Right. In this case, our, our associations are fixed. We know which 3D key points. We're predicting exactly those 3D key points in the image. True, true. Uh, but uh, that didn't get far because uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not the one writing the code. I can't really, <laughs> um, it's hard for me to say why it's not working. I think it partly because uh, the, the staff working on this moved on other things. And, uh, and uh, partly because maybe, I don't know, may maybe forcing the optimization block to learn the association makes it harder. I don't know. Well, we're uh, hopefully you, you can uh, get that working soon because we're looking forward to seeing some of these results. I think it's definitely interesting. Oh, happy interesting for any problem. of you to take this and, and, and run it, run with it. Let us know if you get good outcomes. We'll be happy enough with that. Kim -hee, maybe you can convince some of your students to uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure some of them will be super interested in this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's in, inappropriate to say this in front of Gimhi and Angela. You know, we're all we're all faculty staff. I mean, it, it's hard to uh, convince students to look into geometric techniques, right? Oh, tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, when you mentioned ICP, 
10 years ago, everyone knows what ICP is. Today, the standard PhD student starts by learning CNNs and they don't know things like ICP, they don't know things like epipolar geometry and all that. It's very hard to convince them, hey, you wanna learn this old stuff, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I it actually in practice thinking that that was a challenge, convincing students to look into old stuff. I would believe that somehow in geometry, this should be one of the, the last holdouts where uh, the theory is immutable somehow, right? The theory is right. And if the theory is right, I guess it's right forever. It's right everywhere. As you said, immutable. It's more of a cultural thing. If students think that it's not you know, not attractive to do it. It doesn't add to their CV to get a job at Amazon or Google. They're not going to do it. I, I think that it's not, uh, probably it's not so much about uh, whether they can get a job. Because I think this is pretty much still very useful. The 3D stuff, right? the, the theory are still very useful. It's just a matter of, uh, I mean, from my experience, it's just a matter of how fast the student can get uh, a paper in Sydney. <laughs> Right? I mean, imagine yourself as a student now, like the other guy sitting next to you, working, just tuning the parameters, and he or she gets like a 10 CVPR papers <laughs> <laughs> while you are painstakingly trying to understand all the equation. <laughs> and yeah. this is, this is a, I think this is the major uh, pushing factor of, of, I mean, uh, of pushing factor for, uh, that pushes students away from trying to really understand the hardcore mathematical experience. Yeah, right. yeah, I agree, you're right. Well, I think Prof Chen's work that he presented today is a good exemplification where uh, the we can integrate both of these, right? We can integrate deep learning with traditional theory and also yield better results, right? Mm. So I think this is a I nice... I absolutely thing. agree with this. Yeah. It's a very beautiful piece of work. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you again for speaking uh, in our seminar series, Prop Chen. And uh, thanks, everybody who joined us. Um, we will, of course, edit the video and uh, make it available on YouTube so people can also watch uh, offline. And with that, then, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much for having me again. Uh, very interesting seminar series, fantastic work that you are doing here, especially under this uh, pandemic. It's a unique, refreshing concept. Um, yeah, hope to see this uh, continue even after the pandemic. <laughs>